muted. Such as Brownfields 101 and Brownfields funding, as well as custom trainings. Technical assistance that may cover topics including liability, grant review, community outreach, and others. We also do a variety of policy and research and consulting projects, and you can learn more about us online at our website. Now I'd like to turn to a polling question to learn a little bit more from the audience about your experience with ARC grants. Let's go ahead and open the poll. What types of ARC grants did you apply for this year? And we're watching as these numbers come in. Looks like we're seeing about 22% of the audience applied for assessment grants, 6% applied for cleanup, 4% for revolving loan funds, and 73% did not apply. All right. For those of you who did apply, we're going to open up another polling question here. Who prepared your ARC application? And here we go. And the polls are open. All right. Watching as the data comes in. Yeah. Like the majority of you prepared your grants in-house. We're seeing about 62% in-house, 35% worked with a consultant, and 3% worked with a partner. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much for answering those questions and uh, helping us learn a little bit about you. I'd like to turn now to an overview of what we'll talk about today. Um, in this webinar, we will discuss some lessons from the 2016 ARC grant cycle. We will hear stories from three applicants, uh, and we will discuss steps that you can take to craft more competitive applications. We'll be accepting questions along the way. We'll take a few questions after each speaker, and we will reserve most of the time after all presentations for questions. And I'm very excited to um, be joined by so many, um, so many applicants uh, this year who are interested in this topic. We're going to open up a couple more polling questions before we dive on in. Uh, prior to this year, have you ever received an ARC grant? And the polls are open. And we're seeing 77. 78% saying no, 23% saying yes. All right. For our next question, not including this year, how many times have you applied for ARC funds? And the poll is open. And as the results come in, it looks like about half of you have applied for ARC funds once before, 22% applied twice before, and 26% applied more than four times before. So thank you very much, everyone. All right, with that, I would like to introduce CCLAIR's Director of Programs, Ignacio Dairet, who's going to be sharing with us uh, some information about this last year's competition. Ignacio, take it away. And good afternoon to everyone. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, just as an overview, uh, as a reminder to everyone, uh, this is a chart uh, showing uh, EPA's six programs under their Brownfields program. We'll be talking about uh, revolving loan funds, clear cleanup grants, and assessment grants. Uh, primarily the ones in yellow. Uh, this year, uh, there will not be any revolving loan funds available, although uh, the EPA will be receiving, uh, will be sending out supplemental uh, uh, 
request uh, uh, request will be received from uh, uh, existing RLF grantees. And also yesterday, the area-wide planning grants were just announced. Uh, the guidelines have been released, uh, and uh, there is a webinar information on your screen. Now, while we are not going to be talking about the AW AWP grants today, a lot of the same tips will apply. So please, uh, these will apply as you tell your story and, and uh, other ways in, the, in writing your grant. Uh, the information of the screen will, will repeat later and of course you have the slides. Uh, you can download the slides. Next slide please. So lessons from 2016. The slide shows the history from the past three years. It is important to note that there were no RLF grants awarded in 2015 and there will be none in 2017. As you can see, there appears to be a general decline in the number of communities receiving and applying for grants. However, these numbers can be deceiving as there have been many, many more multi-jurisdictional partnerships, partnerships applying as coalitions or community-wide applicants in recent years. So, uh, while we haven't done a detailed count, uh, we would say that the numbers are actually steady when you're counting the number of actual communities participating in these brownfield applications. Now, some quick lessons from 2016. And uh, is that first, every point counts. The uh, competitions have been becoming increasingly competitive. Uh, as a percentage, you have to get pretty much 95% of the points in order to be competitive. Now that varies uh, between uh, among the assessment, cleanup, and the RLF. But generally, 95% is a good number to shoot for to have comfort that you're uh, very competitive of competitive for these grants. Uh, one implication is, especially uh, if no RLFs are awarded next year is that there will potentially be more money for assessment and cleanup grants. So if you're unsuccessful in 2016, it is worth trying again. This, this would mean that there, uh, that there could be less competition despite the declining success rate from recent years. Still, given the marked improvement in the quality of grant applications, every point counts and no one can afford to leave easy points on the table. During the last two years, the most common areas where points were not realized are listed on the slide. I'll go through each one briefly and we'll focus in a few points in succeeding slides. One common oversight is when applicants do not answer all the questions directly and in order or where the EPA reviewer expects to find them. Related to this, when an applicant does not have a, uh, is not comfortable providing an answer to a specific question, there is a tendency for many of the grant writers to flail at answers, to meander or to overcompensate in criteria where the writer has better answers or has more things to say. EPA reviewers are wise to this and it doesn't work. You will lose those points. Another area is where applicants do not look at all the possible leveraging opportunities. If your community has access to resources, whether they be local, state, regional, you need to look at those and determine if uh, these are, can be directly or, in, or indirectly address your brownfield issues. You should point out these resources uh, that you have tried, tried to use and why these programs apply or don't apply to your community. Also note that EPA reviewers are familiar with the possible resources uh, available in your community generally and expect larger communities to have access and have tried to leverage those resources. The next few areas are interrelated. Solve one and you solve the others. Many applicants do not develop a project description that addresses the impacts that they are trying to mitigate and do not work with the efforts of others in their community. It is important to show the relationship between impacts, both direct and indirect, with the project and how these will produce outputs that bring project benefits and outcomes. 
it's important to identify the staff through the programmatic capability and partners who can make the outputs and outcomes happen. Next slide. So this uh, graphic essentially uh, lays out the relationship among the different elements that an EPA reviewer uh, looks for. And frankly, when CCLIR reviews something, we look at the same relationships. Uh, Brownfields cost direct and indirect impacts to the environment, economy, health, and welfare. And you have to find the indicators and, and statistics that prove this point and relate the story to the reader. Similarly, your brownfield project or program should mitigate the same impacts described in the previous slide to project outcomes and produce benefits reflected in improved indicators. Uh, your team, whether these be staff, consultants, or partners, should be able to deliver the outputs and outcomes that you are talking about. Next slide. So uh, we're going to revisit some of those later and please ask questions, but there's really not enough time in this webinar to discuss all the details of these steps. Those will come later uh, and, uh, and coming soon. So we will have webinars and uh, you can consult with CCLIR individually for your specific uh, issues. Looking ahead, the grant guidelines will be released sometime between August and October. Now August is just two months away. October is four months away. You'll have 60, day, 60 days to write them, so these grants will be, uh, the applications will be due no later than six months from now. So it's really time to start planning, especially if your project is not well defined, if you don't know what resources and activities you have and can leverage, or if you think you, need, you may need more partners. Now for those tips you won't get into today, there will be webinars hosted by different organizations, including EPA regional staff, your state, your regional agencies, by NALJEP, the National Association of Local Government Environmental Professionals, and CCLIR. And some regions and states also host in-person workshops. Next slide. So uh, getting started early, read last year's guidelines. Uh, note, though, that the guidelines do change from year to year. The points are redistributed somewhat. The criteria are juggled. And uh, we hear from EPA staff that there will be some change to the way impacts uh, to health and welfare will be, uh, will be asked of, uh, the, uh, of the applicants. Uh, frequently asked questions are uh, usually note the changes made from year to year, and EPA staff also creates a document highlighting differences from past years. Especially use the tips in the uh, frequently asked questions document. There are so many tips there. You should use them. Now, if you have a, uh, if you're looking for a site-specific grant or a cleanup grant, uh, when the grant guidelines come out, address the threshold criteria as soon as possible but it's never too early to start asking whether your site is eligible or not. Uh, use tab EZ for templates and proposals. There are many good examples of successful proposals in tab EZ. You would have to uh, log in and register for that, but it's a free tool. Uh, and look at the efforts in leveraging others and your partners. Uh, you know, now, uh, EPA grants are not just about you and your job, but really how you can help your community. And there are other people in your community who are working toward the same goal, but have different uh, tools to the, at their disposal. They have different experiences and expertise. So you should really be seeking your partners early and often. Um, now, uh, it will. It will help you to determine your capacity to implement the grant and more staff and services of a consultant. So that, that's why it's very important to be out in the community right now. Uh, with all this work, it's necessary to start way before the 60 days start picking. 
uh, about writing and, and data tips. Uh, now follow the f format requirements uh, because uh, EPA staff really like to see the answers where they expect it. Uh, don't talk in jargon. Um, and the most important part here, and uh, I think Jen can address this. You might. Uh, uh, this is a comment I made of uh, of her grant application. But the Steinbeck with stats. Uh, write it as a story, and don't overload your grant with numbers. Uh, people normally, uh, I've seen uh, applications that are all numbers that have very little uh, relation to the story. And I've also seen stories that are good stories, but they don't have any numbers to back them up. At the same time, I use Steinbeck. Don't be like Daniel Steele or Tom Clancy. We want something that's more direct and uh, ties very well to the numbers. Uh, also about fessing up. Uh, if, you don't, if you really can't address the criteria, just tell the EPA reviewer, be honest about it. Or, you know, because I think, as you confess, you'll actually find an answer that gets around to why you have a challenge. Uh, if you don't fess up and you start wandering, wandering around and uh, filling up the pages with answer uh, with uh, words that don't answer the criteria, then you're not just taking up space; you're taking up the patience of the reviewer. Uh, and all, it's also good to have a, a nice, easygoing writing style. And uh, you know, just minimize the uh, too many adjectives and adverbs. You want action uh, words in this uh, grant application. Next. And here are a few data sources. I think these data sources are uh, pulled from the FAQs. There are many others. And I'm sure that there are data sources that are specific to you because your story and the data that you need to back it up may not be covered in these data sources. So uh, if you can't find them here, you can find them elsewhere. And you can work with your partners to find it. Next slide. Now, benefits and outcomes. Uh, again, talk to the agencies. And I talked about agencies. These are local agencies like fire departments, health departments, public works, parks and open space, housing. Because these, these are all the people who uh, deliver the reuse on properties on the brownfields that you're going to be redeveloping. So you're just getting the brownfields to them. And they can tell you what happens to those projects once they have those, uh, once they have those sites cleaned up. So it's important, it's important to uh, reach out to these partners. Uh, if space is, if you don't have space available in your uh, in your uh, document, always bring up both economic and non-economic benefits. I can't I can't think of any project that doesn't have both. And uh, back up your projections with some data and policy uh, and policy and practice from experience. Next slide. So I'm going to hand it off now to our speakers, who will be giving their uh, uh, experiences in writing grant applications, uh, how and how they've done in the past, and their their tips to you uh, for uh, replicating their success. So uh, we're going to hand it off now to Amber Don and to Ju Julie. Hello, is my microphone working? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. Yes. Say hello, everyone. We are the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe, and this is our story of grant success, presented by Julie Jacobs, Brownfield Specialist, and Amber Down of France, Brownfield's Cultural Specialist. Next slide, please. Our proposal was for a community-wide petroleum assessment within our community borders. We are a Mohawk tribe, and our reservation is tradi traditionally known as Akwazasne, which means land where the partridge drums, and we are part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. We are located on the border between the U.S. and Canada, divided by the provinces of Quebec and Ontario and the state of New York. Our population is approximately 12,500 people, and our reservation is 16,600 square miles. Since we are a federally, federally recognized tribe, we do not have a tax base for generating revenue for public services. 
We're a low-income minority community facing extreme environmental injustices due to industrial contamination, and EPA has designated Akuzasne to be an environmentally overburdened, underserved, and economic, economically distressed area where the environmental needs are greatest. Next slide, please. In 1958, the Seaway International Bridge was opened. This allowed easy access to Akuzasne from a large Canadian population. Since gas prices are on average 50% cheaper in the U.S. after factoring in the exchange rate, a large number of tribally owned gasoline stations and marinas opened on the res. Our gas station petroleum storage tanks are not regulated by New York State, and the USTs, ASTs, and associated piping are not subject to removal deadlines. Therefore, when many stations eventually closed, the tanks and pipings were never removed. We are now plagued with these numerous abandoned tanks and pipes with unknown environmental hazards. The overall objectives for this grant is to identify all of our abandoned gas stations and marinas, rank them based on criteria developed by our own community, and conduct environmental assessments on as many sites as possible. Next, next slide, please. Our previous experience with Brownfields includes our 128A, which funds our Tribal Response Program, and we've had that since 2010. In 2013, we applied for the Workforce Development and Job Training Grant, but we were unsuccessful and decided not to apply a second time. In 2015 was our first attempt at community-wide petroleum assessment proposal. We were unsuccessful but wanted to give it another shot. In 2015, we applied for the revolving loan fund along with our 128A, and that was denied. We're unsure about pursuing that one a second time. From our 128A, we have developed our staff of eight people through extensive grant and program development trainings, collected significant community input through our community involvement plan. We have identified our vital natural resources as well as potential brownfield sites that may pose a threat to these resources and we have developed a process for prioritization based on our community's input. Next slide. Hi, this is Julie. Before we even considered writing our proposal, our staff participated in various grant writing workshops and trainings. One of the most helpful was the Tab EZ hosted by Kansas State University. Utilizing our Brownfield staff, we used four people as writers, three as reviewers, and we had our accountant and tribal grant development specialists to work on our proposal. We also had a consultant, Rich Campbell, from Maine and New Hampshire, PG, and Sarah Seeloff from the CCLR who reviewed our proposal. But the most important and helpful was our debriefing from our EPA project manager after our first failed proposal. When you receive your letter stating that you did not get the grant, you should contact them and request a debriefing. This is where we were told specifically what had lost us points. When we had lost points and we made sure that they were good after we worked on and resubmitted our proposal. Having our own tribal process, we have to submit a completed proposal two weeks prior to deadline to our tribal grants and procurement office for review. Next page, please. Our community partnership. This is an area in which our debriefing where we needed to improve. As an outreach person, I developed many partnerships within the community. I took these partnerships and asked them to provide support letters for us and how they would do it. They included the Akwazasne Boys and Girls Club, where I provide outreach to them. The Akwazasne Chamber of Commerce, where I assist local businesses. Akwazasne Cultural Center Library Museum, where I help to provide support letters and currently I am assisting them on a Citizens Institute Rural on Design project. The Aquazusna Task Force on the Environment, where we work together on various community events to improve environmental quality in Aquazusna. These partnerships matched our goals and values that we found to be the most important through community outreach. Next slide, please. One of the hardest parts of writing our proposal was figuring out how to connect the dots between the environmental and health impacts of our brownfield sites and the project to how they will benefit our community. In our first proposal, we had missed a lot of details and didn't have a good over overall idea of what kind of benefits we wanted. So in this proposal, we started with the benefits and thought about what was most important to us. 
Then we reached out to our community members and asked them that same question. We were able to gather information from our group called the Alquazosne Brownfields Community, or ABC group for short. This group helped us realize that the most important aspects of our community are the natural resources used in cultural practices and places where our people gather, like our children and elders. Once we knew what was most important, we were able to work backwards and make a clear link to our brownfield sites. Next slide, please. Tips and comments. We learned a lot in between our first proposal attempt and our second one. Through the debriefing with our EPA project manager, we realized that we should have spent more time on our community partnerships and we didn't have enough detail. We learned that community input was key to bringing everything together. Our tribal process also requires us to finish the proposal in two weeks before the EPA deadline and we kind of ran out of time. With all of our community input, we were confident this time it was our final proposal we submitted. Our consultant was critical in helping us to understand the grant guidelines and format. Finally, educate yourself and your Brownfield staff. There are always training and webinars to participate in and conferences to attend and network and make new connections. Next slide, please. Working with CCLR, we met Sarah Seeloff in Albany at the New York State Brownfields Opportunity Area Summit last December. We were participants in a grant writing workshop that she was conducting. We took the opportunity to introduce ourselves and share our draft proposal with her. Even though our deadline was a week away, Sarah took the time to work with us. We plan to attend more training and workshops with CCLR in the future. And that ends it. Oh yes, our next speaker is Jen Bildersee with the City of Portland Brownfields Program. So Jen, Hi. are you on? I am. Okay, thanks Ignacio. Good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Jen Bildersee. I'm the coordinator of the City of Portland Brownfield Program. So we're a city program in Portland, Oregon. And we have been around as a program since the late 1990s, which not coincidentally is about when EPA began offering uh, our grants for brownfields. And we received a $400,000 EPA community-wide assessment grant this year. So I'm going to talk briefly about my community, and then I'll just get into um, thoughts on the grants. So Portland is a big place, and our focus area is East Portland, which is the whole eastern block there underneath the arrow. East Portland is a really large area, and many uh, communities and their applications focus on a, a single road or on a single neighborhood. East Portland is a group of neighborhoods where uh, about 150,000 people live. Um, but it's an area of Portland that is far from Portland's downtown core. It lacks many of the amenities that are found in the rest of the city. Um, it has a different character than many of the other neighborhoods in the city. And as inner Portland uh, neighborhoods have gentrified, many of the displaced residents have come to East Portland. Uh, and as you can see in the table, East Portland has a higher percentage of residents of color, uh, residents in poverty, and of other uh, vulnerable populations. So I'll go on to the next slide, please. Uh, East Portland has a bit of a different character because of when it developed. It wasn't a, a streetcar area like some neighborhoods of Portland. It really developed for the car. So there are really large stretches of commercial corridors that have spread out commercial development, and those are our target areas. We're mo looking mostly at um, uh, vacant gas stations, dry cleaners, places that had automotive use, light industrial use, um, and the property values in East Portland are a lot lower than property values in much of the rest of the city. As other areas of the city, property values have, have increased dramatically in the past few years. East Portland uh, property values have often stayed the same. And so many of these brownfield sites just continue to sit vacant. We'll go to the next slide. So Portland has a long history with EPA brownfield grants. Uh, it's really what enabled us to have such a robust program. We were one of the original showcase communities. That's our old logo up at the top of the screen. We have had uh, three flavors of art grants. We've had community-wide assessment grants. We've had uh, site-specific cleanup grants. And we have a revolving loan fund as well. Uh, last year, so the 
In 2015, we applied for a community-wide assessment grant and we were not successful. That was our first time being unsuccessful at an assessment grant with EPA. And it was a real blow to our program. We had projects in line that were waiting for funding. And it was really an important time for us to, to step back and, and figure out what to do. It was our first gap in a funding for assessments. Um, we pretty much knew as soon as that grant was unsuccessful that we would be applying again uh, in this year. Um, and I, I will echo the comments earlier that the, uh, the process of asking for a review with EPA when you have an unsuccessful, an unsuccessful grant application can be very useful. Um, we have uh, my position, the Brownfield Program Coordinator position, is fully funded by the City of Portland. So I am the person who right now writes the grant applications. We'll go on to the next slide. Ignacio asked me to talk a bit about our process. So this is our general timeline um, when we develop a, a grant proposal. The first thing is to develop our goals internally. What types of sites are we uh, are we interested in um, and why? What kinds of outcomes are we looking for? What kind of problems you know, have a real gap and, and where this funding could be a, a useful match? And then right away we start discussing those plans with potential partners. So we have a number of partners in the community and really early on we start speaking with them about um, how these funds might be useful to them, what kind of, uh, of outcomes we, we should um, aim for. We start with our previous grant application, even when it was unsuccessful, that's still where I started. Um, if you don't have a previous grant application, the guidelines are very, very specific. So if you just go point by point on the guidelines, it's already a long way there towards starting to build an application. You're definitely not starting with a blank slate. Um, I start immediately by just filling in all the easily accessible information. So doing things like describing your community, describing your brownfield um, problem, those things you can, you can cover pretty quickly. Um, so all of steps one, two, and three, there's just no reason to put those off as soon as you're interested in applying for some funding. Um, then we early, later, but, but not too late, we move on to number four. We provide our draft letters of support for partners. So the letters of support for the partners, and I wrote letters of support, but they're not actually letters of support, which is really important. They're letters of commitment, and it's a really important distinction. They help outline what exactly the commitments are going to be of, of you as the applicant and of the partners. I really feel like EPA isn't just looking for organizations in your community to say they support your, your work, they support your ideas. They're really looking for the buy-in and the specific actions that your partners are going to take to help make the grant successful. So drafting those letters helps clarify what the roles are going to be, and it also means that you're not asking someone to sign a letter at the last minute. I mean, um, often organizations have their own timeline. They have to wait for their next board meeting before they can approve a letter, um, something like that. And I'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide as well. Um, then we look at the gaps in the application. So certain um, places you really need to dig around for data, and that takes some time. You have to connect with people to, to fill in information. And so having time to do that is really useful. And then we always try and leave enough time to send at least one round of drafts to CClear. Their review is critical in our process. Um, they point out things that we miss, things about our community that are intuitive to us because we live here, and, um, and their edits are a huge step from getting us from a draft to our final version. And then, you know, I left out a step here that's really important, which is when you're done with all of the drafting, sometimes the application is way, way too long. So it can take a chunk of time to just trim it down to figure out what are the least important things that you can get in at that page limit. And then uh, we always aim to revise and submit our application um, to EPA several days ahead because the website in the past has been kind of glitchy and you just, that last day, um, it, there's no reason to have that scary last day. Okay, we'll go on to the next slide. Okay, tips. My most important um, lesson that I have learned over the years of working on these grants is to start building community and agency relationships really early. No one wants that call a week before a grant is due asking for a letter of support. It's, a, it's what I consider a worst practice to, to get in touch with a community organization and say, 
you know, we're doing something that's going to be good for you, so please provide us a letter of support, and we need it in the next four days. It just starts everything off on a really bad foot. So I would say the right time to start working with community agency partners is as soon as you're um, shaping the idea for what you want your grant to be. Um, get a working draft started early. We really started our draft um, as soon as we as soon as we lost the the last grant. We started our draft for the new grant. Um, extra time is helpful in so many different ways. Uh, there are a lot of resources to make use of. EPA offers a whole series of webinars. By the time they offer those webinars, it's pretty late. So again, there's no reason to wait for those um, information sources before you get started. And and of course, see clear review. And, and again, just leaving things till the last minute tends to uh, aggravate the people who you're hoping to work with uh, on brownfield problems over the, over the duration of the grant. And if you aren't successful, get a debrief and try again. Uh, last slide, please. And the last thing I want to say is that it's really worth it. In the time that we have had these grants, we've been unsuccessful sometimes, we've been successful, fortunately more than that, and uh, we've been able to provide financial assistance on 65 properties with community benefit. That's over 74 acres of our city that, uh, that used to be brownfields and that have been cleaned up. And that is largely because of the funding from EPA. And that's it for me. I'm happy to answer any questions um, via email after this presentation as well. So feel free to follow up with me. Thanks. Thank you, Jen. That was great. And our next speaker is uh, Sean Farelli with the city of Tigard in Oregon, not too far from Portland. So, Sean, Hi, you're on. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm Sean you're a bit muffled, Sean. Can you? Sean, are you still there? So while Sean is, uh, we're trying to reconnect with Sean. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll be uh, glad. Okay, there we are. Sean? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that technical difficulty. Um, my name is Sean Farley. I'm the redevelopment project manager for the city of Tigard. Uh, the city center development agency is the urban renewal agency. Um, next slide. A little context uh, for the city of Tigard. We are uh, right next to Portland, uh, population about 50,000, uh, median household income about 62,000. Incorporated in 1961, uh, about 10 miles southwest of the Portland city center. Uh, we have a really good balance between residential and commercial and industrial development. Um, generally, uh, inside of a lot of 1960s style suburban development. Uh, neighborhoods are we're often built without sidewalks. Uh, but we're looking to change this. We have a, a strategic plan uh, that has the aspiration to become uh, the most walkable community in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we set a, a really high bar, but a lot, our, a lot of our residents are really excited about that prospect. Next slide. So the City Center Development Agency is uh, Tigard's Urban Renewal Agency. Uh, this district was approved in 2006 by the Tigard voters. Uh, it's got $22 million in project years, which as urban renewal districts go, is pretty modestly funded. Uh, uh, basically, the idea of urban renewal is that funds that are raised in the district um, increases in property taxes are spent in the district on specific urban renewal plans. And in our case, that includes uh, pedestrian improvements, public spaces, facade grants, facilitating new mixed-use development. Um, and this is district is the location of the site that we uh, were awarded the cleanup grant for. Next slide. So Brownfields in Tigard. Um, the city was awarded a $400,000 uh, EPA assessment grant in 2014, uh, petroleum and hazardous substances. Um, with that money, we've uh, engaged the community. Uh, we did an inventory that identified 
200 potential sites of interest. Uh, we've done about six phase ones and a couple of phase twos. And um, we use this uh, assessment grant to do some of the necessary uh, assessments on the Main Street Santa Creek site that we uh, applied for the cleanup warrant for. Next slide. So the Main Street Santa Creek property, uh, the agency uh, was interested in redeveloping the site because it's in a really uh, prominent location. It's on our main street, and it fronts uh, Sano Creek, uh, which is an important tributary that runs right through our downtown. Uh, in fact, one of the buildings is actually uh, built on piers over Sano Creek, which is a pretty uh, unusual situation. Uh, the historic uses of this site uh, include auto repair, a sawmill. Uh, there's also a dry cleaner adjacent. Um, we became interested in purchasing this property uh, about three years ago, four years ago. Uh, during our due diligence, we discovered that there was contamination on site. Uh, PCE, TCE, uh, CIS12, TCE, and vinyl chloride. And these are products which could have been the result of degreasing agents or possibly tri cleaners. Not exactly sure. Um, so when we found out about that, that put the transaction on hold. Um, we were still interested in the property, um, and so we worked to uh, with uh, getting a prospective purchaser agreement with Oregon's uh, Department of uh, Environmental Quality, and that's uh, an agreement that basically limits the city's liability. And we acquired the property with the PPA in 2015. Next slide. So here's an aerial of the site. Uh, it's two properties. Uh, because of that, we were able to apply for two grants. So we got a $400,000 uh, cleanup grant, two $200,000 grants. Um, we were uh, very happy for that situation because the you know, estimated cleanup costs are approaching uh, that number. Next slide. Here's a photo of the present buildings. Uh, they're in generally pretty poor condition. Uh, these three buildings on two properties, they take up about 200 lineal feet of our main street. So it's very prominent. And it's kind of a you know, visual blight and um, partially vacant buildings. Um, being next to Fano Creek, uh, over Fano Creek, uh, we could connect. Uh, redevelopment of this uh, site to a lot of environmental benefits. Next slide. So this is our, our vision of how we would like this site to redevelop. Um, I'd like to see a four to six story mixed use building and uh, a public space that would uh, front Stanley Creek and provide some visual connection with the creek. Um, grant guidelines don't encourage submitting graphics, but I, I, I use this graphic on the cover sheet. I, I don't know if it, if it helps at all, but uh, next slide. So, um, you know, early on we identified the EPA as a potential source to really help the site's redevelopment. Uh, you know, without cleaning up the site, um, no developer is going to you know, want to touch this site with a 10 foot pole. So uh, we early on uh, decided that we were going to go uh, for a cleanup grant. Um, when you're doing a, a cleanup grant, you need to uh, make sure you leave plenty of time for doing a, uh, or hiring an environmental consultant to do a draft uh, ABCA, which stands for Analysis of Brownfield Cleanup Alternatives. And at ABCA, you need to provide a public notice and provide a public meeting before um, you can submit the grant. So make sure you leave plenty of time for that if you're doing a cleanup grant. Um, the cleanup grant narrative was written by, by me. And I did ask for consultant assistance with the technical aspects, the description, the contamination, the cleanup task descriptions, and since uh, the consultant had done a draft ABCA and a lot of the side of substance. Uh, it made sense to ask them for that information. 
in telling the story of our grant, you know, we made a lot of connections to uh, the visioning and planning work that we've done in our downtown and on this site uh, specifically. Uh, we've made some specific, you know, significant public infrastructure investments and, um, you know, telling a good story and talking about the amount of money you're going to be leveraging through the urban renewal spending was really important as well. Um, make sure you spend, um, when you're doing cleanup, cleanup grant, make sure you spend time on the threshold criteria. Uh, also, I would recommend spending uh, time on your cover letter, uh, telling a good story there. And I um, want to echo what Jen said about getting started early, contacting your community partners. Uh, I probably could have started a little earlier on that, three weeks out, but I'd say earlier is better to get those letters of commitment. And uh, we found CClear's review to be extremely valuable. We had enough time to get um, two rounds of review, and I think that really made our uh, grant application strong. So that's all I have. Thank you, Sean, Jen, Amber, Don. Those are three great stories. And as you can imagine, uh, building successful programs like the ones you've just heard from do take some time, and we're urging all of you to take an, uh, make an early start of it. Contact your EPA and your state staff uh, and your state partners. Uh, so what, what, what's next then? Well, uh, if you applied for and did not receive a grant, uh, definitely ask for a debrief session with your EPA uh, project, uh, with the EPA representatives. Uh, if you intend to use the same application, be sure to recheck the guidelines because the criteria and order of questions change from year to year. If you are successful so you, and you want to apply again, uh, ask your project manager how you can improve because you are just really a few points away from not getting the grant. Discuss with them how you might be able to strengthen your successful application. Uh, address any threshold criteria early, and and don't waste any efforts uh, if if, you, if your site is not eligible. So we have to fix that situation uh, first, uh, and start working on your story, the indicators and statistics to back them up. And many times, the, the sources of those indicators and statistics are your partners, uh, as well as the project and programs that might go into the sites you're going to uh, clean up that will bring the benefits. Uh, these, uh, everyone will be part of your team, and this also helps round out and, and help you figure out uh, what type of consultants you will need uh, to write and implement your program. As for CClear assistance, uh, we find that uh, two reviews are beneficial. Now, in past years, uh, we do not get, well, we receive uh, requests for reviews about two weeks uh, before the deadline. Uh, anything received after two weeks does not give us enough time to review it, get it back to you for you to rewrite them and for us to get a second review. And as Sean mentioned, uh, we had two cracks at Sean's grant application. And we find that uh, one is good, but two is so much better because first, we're able to see where you may have missed things. And second, CClear does not catch everything the first time you review a grant either. So uh, two uh, uh, reviews by CClear is very important. And many times, different eyes in CClear review the same grant application. So uh, for the next round, coming this fall, uh, we would ask anyone who would want at least two reviews to submit the first draft at least a month before the deadline. That will give us time to uh, review it quickly, get, get it back to you, and for you, to find, uh, to correct it, and get it back to us in time for a another review. Uh, but before then, uh, uh, we urge everyone to start writing the grant application. 
Now, so uh, we're going to go to a couple of polling questions now, and the, we have a number of questions that we will get to. We have uh, 10 more minutes, and I think we'll be able to get to most of them, but the first polling, next, first polling question. Oh, just one. Okay. On a scale of one to five, how, is, how likely is it that you will apply for art this year? So we have many definites and some pretty strong ones, and uh, uh, many people are just listening in uh, also. So there are 23% who are <coughs> uh, unlikely uh, to uh, submit, and we have about 46% four, who are definitely, and 21% that are on the fence. Now, uh, after this webinar, we will be sending an email uh, to evaluate this webinar, and uh, it will come from an email or a pop-up screen right after this, the, the, the webinar, so please, uh, those are important to us, and you'll actually identify to us who would like to receive assistance directly from CPLEAR. So we're going to get to a few questions now, but let's see, what's on our next slide? Okay. So uh, again, this information for the area-wide planning grants. Uh, contact your region, your state environmental agency, CCLEAR, and there, uh, there's an email for Sarah and myself. And let's go to some questions here. So a uh, question from uh, number of times applied to the oh. okay. Can you? Yes, uh, th this uh, this the question is: Will the uh, webinar be recorded? Yes, it's being recorded, and it will be available. Uh, it will be followed up in the response email, uh, and we will get contact information for all the speakers uh, in a. Uh, we can we can send we can add it to the handout. Yeah, we will hand it. We'll include that information uh, of all the speakers, so those who want to contact them directly. Uh, the information you spoke of regarding applying for a brownfield grant can information be printed. Yes, we. Uh, uh, you could download the uh, PowerPoint. Um, there should be a tab for handouts in the console on the right of your screen. Uh, look for handouts, and there's a PDF there of all the slides. Can funds already secured to build a trail on a brownfield property count toward leveraging cleanup grant? Uh, generally, leveraging applies to funds that are not from the EPA. So uh, HUD funds are leveraging uh, CDBG, any state grants, but generally EPA uh, grants are not considered leveraging for the purposes of applying for an EPA grant. Okay, what is the cost of associated? Uh, what's the cost associated with CCLEAR review? Uh, I'll let Sarah answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Uh, we are, as an EPA technical assistance to Brownfield's grantee, we review your grant applications at no cost to you. So that is one of the services we provide as a technical assistance provider. Thanks for the question. Yes. And uh, see. now, uh, if you, if uh, again, as a reminder, if it's sent early, and uh, we we generally can get to it very quickly. Actually, our turnaround time is usually. A couple of days, uh, and sh and in in some instances uh, even shorter than that. Uh, let's see. A any questions for our speakers? I'm just wondering. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, my agency was recently awarded a brownfield assessment grant. Is there any advantage or benefit to waiting for the result or outcomes from the assessment project before moving forward? <laughs> with the clean, cleanup grant application. Uh, that's an, it depends, and uh, you know, we can unmute all of those. If our speakers would want to uh, 
chime in. Uh, just uh, you are all unmuted. Uh, but uh, in my experience, is that if that site is ready to go, for instance, if it received a TBA grant or you have other assessments, then uh, you should be good to go. You should wait. Uh, and so if anyone else wants to chime in, please. I agree. Don't wait. <laughs> and I think, uh, Sean, you got your grant two years ago, correct? Your assessment grant? Yeah, that's correct. And we did use our assessment grant to assess this property. Um, so, yeah, I guess don't necessarily wait. Mm -hmm. So, uh, somebody was saying that they couldn't find the handout tab. If you look in your control panel, it should be right above the, uh, the questions the chat section. And it will uh, it'll also, I believe, uh, be provided as a link in the follow-up email. Now, and there's a question here, what percentage of grant applications get funded? Again, that varies from year to year, and we had one slide showing that. But generally, it's about between 30 and 40 percent, depending on the year. Uh, cleanup grants tend to be more, uh, be less, uh, have higher percentage. But again, that varies from year to year. And Matthew, here's a question for you. Which grant category would be used, or is there one, for preparing a cleanup plan? Uh, a cleanup plan, uh, and if anyone from the EPA, please, uh, you can you message us if I, in case I uh, provide misinformation. But from my experience, a cleanup plan can be uh, is a, is a valid task under both a, an assessment and a cleanup grant. Okay. It's probably one of those activities that you can do under either grant. Here's a, a great question, and I think some of our panelists might want to weigh in here. Do you have any tips on how to describe partnerships or the types of supporting documentation that EPA reviewers are looking for? Um. I'll, I'll chime in. This is Jen in Portland. The best way to describe great partnerships is to actually have great partnerships. Um, it takes a while to build those, and so I think the, the situation you want to avoid is to um, be trying to describe robust partnerships that, that you haven't really built yet. Um, EPA, I think, is looking for evidence that you've already done a lot of legwork. Uh, before you, and that's why there's a there's a difference in the letters between just organizations that are expressing their support for your project and organizations that are saying how they're going to be involved in your project. Wonderful. Yeah, this is Julie. Very much. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're um, being an outreach person um, for my tribe. Um, I had to go out and really. Um, promote myself within the community and uh, talk to different organizations to see how we could work together. And it, it started to be successful after our first grant was um, denied because we, we had really no partnerships. And after that, I really worked hard to go out there and find the partnerships for us and see who was, had the same ideas and values that we did. So I think you, you really have to work hard at those partnerships to and to get the letters in there. Make sure you're, you're all on the same page. Great. And here's, here's one more question. Um, let's see. Does a property have to be designated a brownfield by the EPA, or can a community designate a brownfield itself? Ignacio, what do you say? Well, that's a very long answer. I guess the, the, the right way to answer that question is that if it's a site that has a perception of environmental contamination, it doesn't have to be confirmed. Uh, and it, so it could be anyone's perception, it could, and your perception is as good as anybody else's, <laughs> then it certainly you can, that's a brownfield to you. And so certainly you can use that, you can use your funds on that site. 
Great, thank you. Well, folks, with that, it is 2 o'clock, and it is time to wrap up. We have received a number of excellent questions. Thank you so much to everyone for submitting these. Um, what we will do is, in addition to posting a recording of this webinar on our blog, um, we do have an Ask the Expert feature, and so we will uh, go through the remaining questions and uh, provide some written answers along with our recording of the webinar, so stay tuned for that. Um, I do want to close with two additional questions. How can I access more resources like this webinar? Do you have a blog or other resources like fact sheets and PowerPoint slides? And how will I know if you're having a workshop in my area? Um, the short answer to that is you can always visit our website. We do maintain a blog. It's updated frequently. We also have state-specific resources under our, resource, our online resource center. Um, and at our website, we have a variety of fact sheets and other educational resources. Um, we do keep in touch by email, so please do sign up for our newsletter. Um, you've, if, if you've signed up for this, for this webinar, then, uh, then that's a great start. And we, uh, if you're not already on our newsletter list, we can, uh, we can make sure that you get those as well. Um, and thank you, everyone, for attending this afternoon. We will be sending a survey, as Ignacio mentioned, and, and we really would look forward to your feedback to help us identify ways that we can continue to work best with you and your communities. Ignacio, any final closing words? Uh, start writing. We'll have to see your drafts tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> you said it. Thanks again, everyone. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>